So I'm going to talk to you about a project that we run at CAT called Zero Carbon Britain. Um, it's been running since about 2007, and we released our third report last year, which is called Rethinking the Future. And I've been asked to talk about this question. How do we create a viable environment for future generations? I'm just going to edit it slightly, though. And I'm going to replace viable, which I think is a bit mm, iffy, with better. How do we create a better environment for future generations? And I mean better in comparison to the kind of future that we're looking at at the moment. Because if we look at graphs like this that tell us where we're heading in terms of problems like climate change, the outlook is pretty grim. My background's actually in climate science, so I've been looking at this end, this 2100 end of the graph, and I can tell you without going into too much detail that we really want to avoid it. If we look at this particular graph here, you can see that even with the kinds of actions that we're taking at the moment, even with the Climate Change Act here in the UK that gives us an 80% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, globally, we're not changing the picture that much. We're not actually making a significant enough contribution globally to be able to change the kind of future that we're heading towards. And if we look at the kinds of things that take us to a different, a better environmental future, then we actually find that the kinds of things that we need to do to get there are very different. We need significantly more ambitious aims when it comes to climate change. And we also have to accept that we will need to make some big changes. In fact, we have a choice about our future. So we can either choose to make the big changes ourselves, we can make those changes through a democratic or perhaps an economic system, or we can have big changes imposed upon us. If the climate changes, we will have to react to that. And the further we go along that trajectory that's more like business as usual, the more we will have to change in response. So why don't we just make those big changes first, right? And that's basically what Zero Carbon Britain is about. It's about asking that question. If we take climate change seriously as an issue, what does that mean for the kinds of things that we have to change? What does it mean for life in the UK? What does it look like? What do we do? Do we still get to go outside? Is it OK to breathe the atmosphere? Um, so this is basically where we're at. We're making a situation in Zero Carbon Britain that's sort of a technically robust scenario for a future where the UK has risen to the challenge of climate change. And that basically means going from this, which is where we are today in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions in the UK, Lots from energy, some from non-energy processes, industry, waste, that kind of stuff, and a bit from land use. But basically, today, a huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions, and in ZCB, we change it to this. Hugely reduced greenhouse gas emissions. A little bit more carbon capture in the system means that we're net zero. So we're actually having net zero climate impact in our ZCB scenario. And that's what it says. It proves, actually, and I'll prove it to you as I take you through the description of it, that we can run the UK on net zero greenhouse gas emissions. What's more, back to that better environment for future generations, I actually think this future is a pretty good one. We make improvements not just to a global environmental picture, but to our local environment. We're more healthy. The places that we live in and work in are not better for us. Um, and perhaps we have a higher well-being in this scenario. And the great thing about it is that we already have all of the technology and all of the know-how to get there. We don't need to wait for someone to develop something new. We don't need to wait for someone to come up with a fantastic new solution to something. We can actually, if we want to choose to do this, start acting now. So what are these changes? What do we have to do? How do we get there? What does it look like? First, I'm going to take you through the energy system in, in Zero Carbon Britain. Most of our emissions in the UK come from energy, about 82% of them. So it's a really big thing that we have to deal with. And first, we do this thing called power down, which is basically reducing our energy consumption. And given currently available technology, we reckon we can decrease the amount of energy that we use in the UK by 60%. That's not 60% in everything that we do. Stuff like industry, appliances, things that we flick on and off and switch can get a bit more efficient, 
but we can't actually make very much difference to the amount of energy that we use in them. In terms of our buildings, heating in particular, not necessarily hot water, although it's included in this diagram, we can make massive reductions in our energy demand. And this is basically because, unfortunately, in the UK, we have a terrible housing stock. It's very drafty, all of the heat that we put into it goes out. And if we make some really, really advanced technological changes, like insulating and putting in double glazing, then we can reduce our energy demand pretty much by about 50%. The last 10% on here is actually to do with having better control over our temperature. So that's partially to do with us controlling putting on a jumper rather than turning the thermostat up, but also controlling it in terms of perhaps only heating the rooms that we're using instead of an entire massive building where we're not, only, we're not using most of the rooms. That gives us an extra 10% in terms of our energy demand reduction from buildings. Transport is another area where we can make massive savings in terms of our energy demand. Actually, this is the, the biggest savings of all of the sectors that we look at in ZCB. And partially, we say, hey, let's just travel a little bit less. You know, let's perhaps live a little bit closer to where we live, uh, to where we work, or to where we socialize. Let's do things like use Skype to chat to friends that are far away, or things like this, where you can watch over the internet what's going on somewhere halfway around the world. This is great. Another thing that we do is say, hey, let's just change the way that we travel around. Let's use things like our feet and bicycles really great zero carbon forms of transport, highly technologically advanced. Let's use a bit more public transport, and yeah, a little bit less car use, but actually you can see in our scenario, we've still got a fair amount of personal car use there. These things all together give us an energy demand reduction in transport of about 35%, but we can do better than that. That's the, basically that first pillar, so that's our 35%, which is all of those changes that I've just gone through. The second pillar, in my eyes, the economists among us might not agree, in my eyes, is free. Basically, it's electrifying our systems. It's going from using uh, petrol and diesel to using electric cars, for example. And that's because electric cars, they go about three or four times as far using the same amount of energy as a petrol or diesel car. So we can go further with the same amount of energy. So that gives us, as far as we can, there are some systems that we can't electrify. We can't have electric planes, for example, so we have to decrease the amount of flying that we have. But where we can, we electrify systems. And that brings us to this massive 78% reduction in terms of energy demand for transport. But even making these reductions, we've still got a fairly significant amount of energy that we need to make, right? And we say we can do that using 100% renewable resources. We don't need nuclear, and we certainly don't need fossil fuels. We want carbon-neutral forms of energy, and largely we can do this because we're very fortunate in the UK, although in terms of different types of renewable resources, other countries around the world's pictures will look different, but it's still possible for most places. We are incredibly lucky in the UK. We actually have not just one of the best wind resources in Europe, but in the world. And we say in Zero Carbon Britain that we should be using that more to our advantage. Which is why, in terms of our energy mix, we get about 50% of our energy from wind. That's onshore and offshore wind. The rest of the renewable resources that we look at, in order to, in order to create this 100% zero carbon energy system, so that's our emissions are down uh, minus 100% now in our energy systems in the scenario because of these changes that we've made, we basically look at assessments saying how much the potential of various re renewable resources are in the UK. And it turns out we have absolutely loads. We have far more than we need, actually, in the UK. So we just employ various different renewable resources to various different degrees to make sure that we're meeting those energy demands. And in Zero Carbon Britain, we actually make sure that we meet those demands at every hour. We know that renewable resources don't always produce energy. But we've made sure in this system that actually we have a reliable system that produces energy as and when we need it, even when the wind doesn't blow, even when the sun doesn't shine. You can still turn things on and off if you want to, still put your heating up if you need to. And I can say that because we've done this incredibly detailed hourly energy model. Basically, over a 10-year period, we took data 
of wind speeds, of solar radiation, of temperature, of various types of different demands that we have in the UK for energy. And we modelled our system, so our renewable energy supply and our energy demands over that 10-year period. That's about 88,000 hours over that 10-year period of each of those bits of data. So I'm just going to give you an example here. So we've got, if we to put, for example, two offshore wind farms in these locations, given the wind speeds that we put into our model, we could tell how much energy they would output for every hour of those 88,000 hours. And we can do, on this top graph as a bit of a demonstration over seven days' worth of data, we can do that for all our renewable resources. And on the bottom, we can do that for all of our demands. I and mean, you can see on the bottom that the last few days there are actually a little bit colder because our heating demand's gone up somewhat. And that's because it's dependent on that temperature data. So then we put them together and we go, do they match up? And the answer is no, not all of the time. Unfortunately, they don't. We kind of already suspected that, but we hadn't really looked into it to see how bad the problem was. It's not that bad a problem. 83% of the time, we're producing enough or surplus electricity to our needs. But it's that 17% of the time that we've really got to worry about. And some things like smart demand management, using smart appliances that use electricity when it's readily available, or charge your new electric car when other demands are very low, can help, but they don't solve the problem. And actually what we need is a, a longer term for of storage. And what we use in ZCB is this synthetic gas. Now this synthetic gas is actually chemically pretty much the same as the fossil fuel gas that we have today. It's a hydrocarbon. And I'll just take you through this picture. So we use renewable energy to create this surplus electricity. Surplus electricity takes water, H2O, splits it into hydrogen and oxygen. You take the hydrogen, you combine it with some carbon from the biomass that's in the top right-hand corner, and you put them together and you make a hydrocarbon. Except that it's a hydrocarbon that is entirely carbon neutral. As long as you've got renewable, renewably produced energy that's making your electricity, and you've got biomass that's grown sustainably, that means that we have to replant it as soon as we've cut it down. So any of the trees and grasses that we use as biomass, we have to make sure they're stored sourced sustainably. We can put these two things together and we can create synthetic liquid fuels and synthetic gas. And most of that goes to meeting demands in industry and in transport that can't be electrified. But a very, very small proportion gets burned in basically gas power stations. They're gas power stations that exist not in the UK today, but in other places around the world. You have to be able to ramp them up and down very, very quickly because it has to be a very responsive system to cater for those parts where we have a shortfall in our energy, where we're not actually producing enough electricity to supply what we need for our demands. So that kind of fills the gap that we require, making it a reliable energy system. But this obviously has implications for land use. We need to grow that biomass somewhere. And if you remember back to a graph that I showed at the beginning, we've also got some emissions that currently come from land use that we need to deal with. And there's another thing that's really concerning me, which is about producing food, which is really important. But thankfully, we can actually grow most, 85% of what we need to eat a healthy and sustainable diet here in the UK. And I know that because we've made another model, which is basically looking at the kinds of foods that we eat and our dietary choices and seeing what the nutritional implications of eating them are, how good they are for us, and whether or not they satisfy food group balance. I can see how much emissions are associated with the production of each kind of food, and I can see how much land we need to make it. So very loosely, if you look at this example here, I've picked it because it really is actually, in terms of our agricultural systems, the livestock that's an issue. You can see on the left here that producing beef actually has a huge incursion in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, and it uses a hell of a lot of land, especially when you compare it to plant-based protein sources on the right. So what we do is we make some dietary changes that are fairly radical. We do, in fact, reduce the amount of meat and dairy consumption that we have. We make sure there's enough milk for everyone to have tea and coffee in the scenario, though, which I think is very important. Um, and, and we increase the amount of plant protein sources that we eat. We make some other dietary changes that are more to do with our health, more to do with having a balanced diet. But basically, it's the protein changes that have this implications for greenhouse gases. So we make changes to our diet. We also half our food waste. Does anybody know we, we waste between 30 and 50% of the food that we have in the UK? 
So we say, let's not do that, that's a bad idea. Um, and we also improve agricultural practices. And together, these actually decrease our emissions from land use by 75%. So there's still some emissions from land use in our scenario. We could go further. We could ask everyone in the UK to be vegan, but we're not sure that would really rub well. So we've gone for a, a compromise scenario. But we do end up with a healthier diet. If you look at the circle in the middle, that's basically what people recommend in terms of food group balance that we should be eating. On the left-hand side, on the outer circle, is what we current eat, currently eat and drink in the UK. And you can see, for example, why the government is trying to tell us to eat five fruit and veg a day, because we're really not eating enough. On the right is the diet in ZCB, and you can see that we've actually constructed a diet that, yes, is fulfilling that food group balance for us. So it's a healthier diet. It also uses less land. On the left, we've got today's scenario, where we're using 70% of our land in the UK to produce about 45% of our food. On the right, we've got Zero Carbon Britain, where mainly by making those dietary changes and through reducing the amount of waste, we use about a third of our land for food production. <coughs> but we produce 85% of what we eat. And that gives us some land that's spare, that we can use for other things, like growing that biomass for our energy system. We've got enough space to grow all of it. We don't need to import it from anyone else. We can grow it all ourselves. We can make sure that it's sustainably produced, that we plant something new every time we take something out. And we have more space for natural systems. And this is really important, not just from an enjoyment perspective, from being able to go out into the countryside and enjoy it, but also from a zero carbon perspective. It's those natural systems, those trees that we plant, and peatland that we can restore, that actually captures those remaining bits of carbon that we're emitting into the atmosphere back into the land. So our land is really key. It does these three things marvelously for us in the scenario. It produces food for us, produces biomass for our energy system, and makes our system carbon neutral by capturing carbon out of the atmosphere. And on top of that, there are other benefits to this scenario. It's not just all about carbon. There are many other problems that are facing us today. We reckon this scenario will make more jobs for people. We also reckon that it will increase our resilience. We're already seeing some of the effects of climate change here in the UK. And we need to be prepared for a few more. So making these changes will increase our resilience against them. It will also help the outlook for biodiversity, more natural spaces, more preserved habitats, will help biodiversity that's currently at a declining at a rate of knots. And more than this, we're creating a positive future, that better environment for future generations to live in. And we hope you will join us in getting there and embrace the changes that are required. Thank you very much.